Welcome everyone to Senate Education. This is Friday, January 19th. We have uh, a couple things on the agenda. We're gonna start with a review, some feedback, some ideas around S204, Senator Kulik's work on reading assessment and intervention. And then we'll shift to, uh, we have some folks from the University of Vermont coming in to talk about the higher education incentivization in Vermont. So we are so happy to have uh, the team that's over here with us from the Agency of Education. Great to see you, Mr. Carolis, and his, is it pronounced Porcella? Sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, and the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having us and the team. Uh, I'm Jessica Carolis, for the record, from the Agency of Education. I'm the director of the Student Pathways Division, and I'm joined by my colleague. I'm Meg Porcella, or Porcella. I am the director of the Student Support Services Division. Agency of Education. And we also do have two additional colleagues, uh, or three, one online, and we're very excited to introduce very Heather. Cool. So Heather, uh, could you put yourself on the record? For sure. I am Dr. Heather willis Doxy. I am the new state director for special education, and I'm happy to join you all. Wonderful. And welcome. We're so glad. I don't know if you saw Senator Gulick actually was applauding. applauding. We're so excited that you're here. So Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. And then we also have... Hi, um, I'm Emily Loita. I'm the uh, English Language Arts and Literacy Specialist at the Agency of Education. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Emily Lesh, the Act 28 Project Manager at the Agency of Education. Great. And uh, both Emily's, Emily Square, EL Square, uh, are in the Student Pathways Division. So um, we're very excited about this stuff. We're really appreciative of this. And we may have overstretched a, a tiny bit because we were trying to be efficient. And I will say it's not as organized as it probably could be. Um, so we're happy to come back or clarify or dig in. Um, but we sort of, we saw that there was, you know, about, you know, five big buckets um, that folks are attempting to achieve, that you're attempting to achieve with this bill, and very much so a continuation of um, both existing regulation, what we began with Act 173, what we have been able to move forward with Act 28, um, and particularly uh, this focus on thinking about how we continue to support students who, who need those additional supports. Um, we, we did it, um, perhaps this is not by design, <laughs> but we would like to think it was. We did feel like we saw a lot of our existing policy leaders in here, and we, we outlined them here. I think we brought some handouts, but uh, we don't need to paper you too much, but if you're interested, they're uh, larger excerpts. But as you may recall, there are four major policy levers that we identified to implement Act 173. Um, one was around needs-based professional learning, and I think that was called out very clearly in the DMG report, and I think we've been hearing it even in folks who've been giving testimony on this bill, that there is a need for professional learning, needs-based professional learning. Where are we? In? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm not reading the testimony directly, but we're on page two. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Good to see you. Good to see you. Oh, so the appendix. Yes. Okay, thanks. So we're on page two um, of the of the testimony, right. and I'm I'm not gonna read. We have we don't. I don't think we have time. I want to make sure that we can get to questions. But I I do think framing it that we have really organized our work around the provision of needs based professional learning. We know that even the quote at the top. Um, and, and what was uh, excerpted in Act 28 is that there was a need to have educators who had um, expertise in working with students who may need additional support, but also expertise in delivering reading instruction. Um, coordinated curriculum and curriculum content is incredibly important. And there's been a lot of discussion around evidence-based practices and instructional practices. Uh, tiered systems of support and education support teams. And so there's a lot in this bill that I think is reflecting those layered systems of support and how is it that we are collecting student data and then responding to that data in a timely fashion. And then finally, local comprehensive assessment systems, which are certainly implicated in the discussion around screeners, universal screeners, and dyslexia screeners, 
and really foundational to collecting those that student data to inform instruction, investments, interventions. Um, we do have, so if you look at page three, I think we try to organize this into just some general observations, and then we try to have a second piece around specific components of you know the five pieces that the bill is proposing to do. The, the testimony, not the this. So sorry. Mm -hmm. This is a fun it's game that we like to play on a Friday, yeah. which is which piece of paper should you be looking at? Sorry, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Are you speaking to like very specific technical changes in the bill right now, or are these just more like yeah. broad? I'm going to get some broad, and then there's some specifics. Okay, great. Um, and you can take or leave it as if. But you know. generally, you're coming with supportive, encouraging, enthusiastic for the bill itself. Yeah, That's particularly what, because like it fits. Great. Much of it fits within great. what we're trying to do and what we have been doing and great. continues us in the direction. Thank you. Um, but, you know, so. Uh, Generally, there's a terminology section on page three, um, and we're not trying to be nitpicky, but I think just this idea of like deficiency sometimes can strike people the wrong way. Um, and we, we understand that even if it's used as a term of art, sometimes it feels like it's applying to a person and not like a skill. And so we you know, recommend something like exhibits a substantial reading deficit um, so that this idea that deficits can be overcome, but if you're deficient as a human being, it kind of doesn't always strike the right way. Um, we also uh, were thinking that perhaps aligning to uh, definitions of dysgraphia and dyslexia that are in accordance with IDEA and how it describes specific learning disabilities, but also, and we, we both have them hyperlinked, but excerpted here, certainly the International Dyslexia Association's definition of dyslexia might be just a good fit for consistency going forward and so that there's not, you know, terminology mix up. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, we have to do this all the time, just wherever there's a parent or family, perhaps replacing with caregiver or guardian, knowing that we have folks who have different family um, configurations. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Um, as far as fiscal and programmatic impact, and, um, you know, I would not, uh, it, it may be selfish, but I would not be doing um, myself a service or my colleagues a service if I, I didn't identify that we do have a literacy project manager position who has been able to help us advance this work despite sometimes some pretty significant obstacles. An example would be, you know, we are contract, right? It took, I mean, I think ADS identified after two years that they were not going to leave the contract, right? And we executed that within a month. And I think it's only because of the additional capacity that we had. And, and so, I'm not sure that some of the things that are outlined here would be possible if we don't think about how is it that we support them. So we have, you know, periodic workshops, uh, providing evidence-based reading instructional programming. I think even universal screeners at no cost. And I know that there are sometimes universal screeners that you can see online that are directed at families, um, caregivers, parents around screening for dyslexia, but there are no, there, evidence-based recommended universal screeners or dyslexia screeners that don't have a cost associated and um, that there is no state appropriation that exists prior to the pandemic or after that would allow us to sort of achieve that goal of providing universal screeners at no cost to all school districts and um, independent schools. However, I am very appreciative of the inclusion of independent schools because uh, certainly, if we want to advance yes, literacy learning in the state, it's not just for some students, right? right. We want it for everyone, and, and we're highly appreciative of that. But we did pull together an estimate, and looking at the professional learning, the grants, um, the coaching that we've been able to provide specific to literacy, including in areas of assessment, the purchasing assessment, et cetera, that has all been federally funded, and that's been approximately $6 million dollars of our ESSER funds that we've used to advance that work. Uh, we are not expecting that the state would be uh, giving us $6 million, but to understand that when we're wanting to do something, um, and certainly with inflation and the pandemic, costs have gone up across the board, including with vendors who provide services to state education agencies. Can I start? Sure. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, please. please. Share. Yeah, Thank please. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm understanding, knowing that it's late in the day on a Friday. 
Um, so in this section, fiscal and programmatic impact. Um, so I, I think it seems like there's not a recommendation, so I'm not sure if you can do that, but a maybe suggestion or you're identifying that the literacy project manager position should continue, correct? That would be my recommendation. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the universal screeners at no cost, so you're saying that that seems virtually impossible. Um, so the options would either would be that we either find a source, a financial source to pay for mm -hmm. universal screeners, or you would ask local LEAs to pay for their own. With a re yeah. recommendation coming from you. Yeah, and I, I think that the that is very achievable. Yes. One, we have already pushed out about three hundred fifty thousand dollars in grants to help uh, locals purchase assessment systems and programs. We have also been publishing guidance, which I believe we also have, but we will not hand out <laughs> right now because uh, I'm sure it will be confusing. But we can we can continue to tailor that those recommendations and that guidance, but they do have funds and because it's already in the education quality standards that you have to have a local comprehensive assessment system. Our guidance then says part of that includes universal screeners. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about what types of universal screeners and what they do. Mm -hmm. All of that is already a requirement and they have funds. And so that seems the most efficient for the state. Yeah. We've been already pushing them in that direction, and, and they want to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if there was to be an investment of a, an appropriation of any sort, it would be to continue to support both the mechanism by which we could provide professional learning through our learning management system and to design professional learning. Yeah. Um, and the learning management system is uh, it's, it's the modules. Yeah, it's a it's the, the, pla the platform which the modules... Okay. Modules that then available for other uh, learning modules. Okay, <laughs> and and we have we're on, well we're on track too to there for instance the Vermont Early Learning um, Standards modules yes, right modules will be will be posted in there. So uh, already we're we're wanting to get the most bang for our buck with that. Um, so. The other piece, uh, you know, is with the annual report, um, and this I genuinely is not whinging, but in looking at what you want in that report, we are actually already on our way because our investments in those local assessments have been with an idea to modernize our Vermont Comprehensive Assessment Program, mm -hmm. including having folks, folks were directed to purchase assessments that reported in common measures. They're called lexiles and quantiles, and that's English and math. Both of those are measures in, at our state summit of assessment so that people could be speaking the same language between local assessment, if you want to track student progress, and state assessment, which really is measuring system progress, right? So, but that takes a lot of work. Our data collection system is designed for federal reporting. Um, I, I think you know this, we sort of talked about this with Holocaust education. Um, we do have, I think, a, a easier road ahead with what you're asking for, but we would need to build it in our grants management system. And we also want to make sure that there's some flexibility to leverage existing processes and procedures, including our continuous improvement plans. I think at our last review, almost every system had literacy in the continuous improvement plan. And what we would want to do is have people having to report the same information in multiple places. And we want to just make sure that we could design a process in which if we're asking for data to inform a report that they only really have to do it once and we're ingesting it in one place. Right, okay. So yeah. it sounds like we'll have to dig into that. Yeah, we could, more. we could, but yeah. you know, and I think just a, a little bit more of a longer timeline for us yeah. to like do that okay. um, would be helpful. Um, uh, and I, I think I already touched on this around the professional learning. Um, so the last piece would be, and um, I think all of us have, have consistently breezed over this, is in 60 BSA 2903B, the Agency of Education is not identified as the responsible party uh, for literacy learning in the state. It's the State Board of Ed and the Agency of Human Services. And um, I don't know if we want to correct that. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we're not in statute this year, but can you say it all right? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh so 16 VSA, yeah. right? So uh in part B, it describes that the responsible entities for literacy learning and the state literacy plan are the State Board of Education and the Agency of Human Services. Yes. I know. Good. See, everyone, mm -hmm. everyone, right? I know. But that's that's how right. I mean, there's a lot of work here. So, right? Here's the opportunity. <laughs> so, who knew? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Wow. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much for pointing that out. So, um, getting into some of the specific pieces, I would just skip over for but what's there, and you'll have the digital copy. Is there's some hyperlinks so you can see some samples of the guidance that we've provided, um, and we, you know, again, are just incredibly grateful for using, you know, assessments and terminology that are consistent with already existing uh, regulation. Um, I think, and this is where I would say that I'd love to invite Heather in. There were some concerns around some of the specificity of the language, um, and also, you know, again, going back to that idea of purchasing screeners, whether we might want to consider focusing language on the data that comes out of those universal screeners and how we would use the data versus specifying particular screeners um, and how they might be used. Because again, people already have them, as we think we have about 65% of the SUs that responded, and I think it was 42 SUs responded to our survey, are using screeners, universal screeners. And so we wouldn't want to have them spend effort like thinking that they have to roll those over, but rather consulting with us, identifying that this what the screener can do and that it is in service to the goals of this bill, and then focusing on how you then use the data versus, you know, we're going to wipe everything out, all that investment, and then push something new out at expense to the state. I know this is a hard question, but I mean, are you confident that screeners that exist right now in Vermont are quality? There there are many that are, yeah. Many that are, yeah. maybe some that are. There might be some that are, and people are starting to roll that over. And that, that's what you want to focus on, yeah. is not having everybody replace everything, but rather uh, targeted intervention. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know how we would do that, but we can talk. Well, it's a great question. And so the screeners exist where right now? I mean, they're all over, right? Some are in districts, some are at private centers, some. I, was, I didn't want to cut. cut no, please, go ahead. Um, so, and I imagine that uh, Emily is about to pull this out, <laughs> but I think what we have is we were to talk about the the names of the screeners. So, so there's one that's the stars is one that's okay. that's popular. Um, that would be something that's uh, used at the school level because it goes for a cer certain grade band. Uh, another one might be the measures of academic progress. We call it maps testing. That's another one that's very popular. Um, uh, and so I think maybe reverse engineer. Those are the two that are the most popular, I believe. I'm not saying something that's out of line. Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe if we were aware of, of schools that were using ones that were lower on the the scale of uh, an evidence base, then then that's where we could we could target. The, you know, are you getting the right data from the way you're using this particular screener? Right. I I, I think also right that. There's no one screener that does And there's everything. not one, like exactly. when you look at that list. Okay. And so what we have, like you'll see in the testimony on page five at the top, very top there is a hyperlink um, that you'll be able to, to access. There are reviews where it will tell you like this screener kept, you know, kept phonological you know, awareness or processing, et cetera. So mm -hmm. what we have are a couple of things. One, reviews of uh, screeners that we know are being used at districts with uh, at accommodations, recommendations, limitations about what they can and can't do and the evidence base behind them. We also have a single point rubric by which systems can evaluate the effectiveness of their L LCAS, their local comprehensive assessment system and the assessments within it as it aligns to our guidance. And so those are things that we can continue to improve. And certainly what we wanna do is look at what you're trying to do here in the bill and update um, our tools Right, that we could work through with you to just say, like, this is what it's doing. Because I think that's what you want to do. You want to, we don't want to have people think that someone else is doing all the thinking for them. 
that's what gets us into trouble. We don't want a teacher to lose all agency because what happens is then they start to treat it like it's widgets where it's like, check, check, check. You want them to engage with the process. You want them to self-assess, to use those tools, and then to make changes. Yeah. So screeners, are we talking to an actual person? Or are we talking oh, no, it's a, it's a tool. It's an it's assessment. It's electronic, it's, yeah. Well, digital. Actually, I'll, I think a lot of them are done face-to-face. -face. It's oh. one one teacher to one. But we're not talking about the cell. We're talking but, about tests. Yeah, okay. yeah, but we are talking about assessments. Okay. Um, but I don't, yeah. We can get into the mode, yeah. but. Yeah. And that was a question I had for you was, do you feel that, um, so we had a, we had someone in to testify the other day who had gone through the Ort Giddle Cam mm -hmm. uh, program to learn how to teach how to read. Mm -hmm. right. Did I say that right? right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, do you feel that um, the modules that have been created and the other resources that you're providing, do you feel like it would adequately, adequately teach someone how to teach the science of reading? I think we have designed this to be a, a 101, but I would invite Lloyd and Lesh, because we did take screenshots, but we did not bring them, that's yeah. not me. Um, if you want to talk about maybe what's in those uh, outlines to just share a little bit about the content. Yeah, so um, it, it is. I mean, the, the first module is is basically that, um, you know, what is the science of reading? How does the brain learn um, in, in general? And then also just, you know, acquire those reading skills. And so um, we've got that first module that's for all teachers. And then after that, they go from um, their banded. So we've got like the early literacy, which is K3. And then we've got that four through 12 for adolescents who have different needs, right? Than the um, early learners. And they're also designed so that all different content teachers can access the material and understand like the high school science teacher can see what is my role in teaching kids how to read and teaching kids through reading and writing um, and supporting them when they struggle. So um, we've been doing extensive reviews of the materials before it's published, making revisions and edits. Um, we introduced uh, the vendor who is creating the modules to a uh, national expert, Dr. Cartwright, and um, she's also reviewing the modules before they're published. Um, and so we're, we're making sure that the material in there is aligned with the most up-to-date evidence-based practices that exist. Great. We, and we can send this to you, but yes. you know, this is like, you know, it gives it to you like, okay, phonics instruction. What what do you what do you do when you're doing it? So we have a detailed outline that we made PDFs that we can send to you to give you a sense. I just think I don't think we would extend to the, the point of saying, okay, you go through our entire module series mm -hmm. and now you're a certified, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. specialist. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly it gets into instructional practices, assessment practices based on the neuroscience uh, underpinning uh, language acquisition, literacy, reading. And, and our goal was just that, that it be you know, really for any teacher, not just one mm -hmm. who's... Yeah, just, but but right. but then for that for this first set and then with the ability yeah, to okay. to to add on more uh, discrete topics right. around that 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 could be tailored for specific uh, teachers that maybe the high school the high school science teacher would need but but that again goes back to the learning management system and and just like the grand scheme yeah that we had so the reading endorsement you don't propose any changes to that. Uh, a reading teacher endorsement, mm -hmm. or we're not getting into that without teaching. No. Yeah, no. I and, and I wouldn't want to get into that without having our colleagues from the licensing division okay. and the Europa review. And I think I, I put that in there around the EPPs. Certainly, it's worthy of discussion. But uh, how post secondary is structured is definitely different from K twelve, and so I, it would be important that Ellen and um, Andrew were here to weigh in because otherwise they're victims of our right ideas. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we did provide some, you know, uh, proposed edits, but I wouldn't weigh into that too heavily. It was uh, trying to be efficient and then um, really being like it'd probably be better for another time. I do think this idea of replacing language that like focuses so that it focuses on using the data, right, with uh, then informing intervention and ac actions and instructional practice, et cetera, versus uh, focusing on 
being like, these are all the things that, you know, your screeners must do. Again, I think to stay evergreen, to stay current with educational research, but also because there's just no one screener that does it all. Um, there are also screeners that folks may have that may, maybe they are not designed specifically as screeners of dyslexia, but certainly can give information about um, propensities towards or risks of having a reading deficit. Um, and again, staying away from that language of a disorder or disability, because obviously that's when you're moving through those layers of support. So you, you're you suggesting an edit on the second page of the bill where it talks about the universal screeners and screeners for dyslexia characteristics shall measure skills based on grade level predictive measures, including, and you don't like that list, letter sound and name, fluency, phonemic awareness. Yeah, I think we could just target it at like, in order to inform right, what it is that you're going to do, because we can provide the guidance. There is already guidance around what informs, you know, what, what you might use for dyslexia, what, what you might be doing for universal screener. Is it a totally exhaustive list or is it not? I, I feel like by having that level of specificity, it might create some confusion and versus having it in rule policy and, and guidance. I thought we think about that. So yeah. I do think one of the we can give you of the bill that, yeah. is to get specific, you know, it is to yeah. specific something. around the actual diagnosis. Specific around yeah. pretty much everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but definitely uh, as, you know, what to do, um, you know, mm -hmm. when you yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh let me just think. So Heather, I'm I'm wondering if you might want to weigh in here. Yeah. So um hi everybody again, I'm Heather. Willis Doxy, and I also come from a strong background in literacy work um, with the Florida Department of Education. I was the deputy director for Just Read Florida there and was already heavily involved in a lot of policy um, around what we're doing here in Vermont. Um, the caution, um, again. Heather, can I just ask you real quick? Sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you. When you say, um, lit when you talk about literacy, um, the science of reading literacy? I mean, there's, you know, literacy can mean yeah. so much. That's a fair question. Um, literacy does mean so much. Um, so in the general umbrella of literacy, I also um, served as the special education reading specialist prior to going into leadership in the, in the actual reading department and um, led the state in um, professional development and technical assistance in the area of dyslexia. Um, and I went back to um, to gain knowledge. And I, if there's ever the opportunity to share a little bit more, I don't want to go into too many details right now, but I am very passionate about making sure that educators have the tools and the professional development that they need to not only teach students to read, but to understand when students don't understand and they're not getting it, what in the world am I supposed to do about it? And I think that's where the root of... Um, what the bill is trying to get at. Mm -hmm. When we circle back around and focus on how we're preparing teachers and making sure they have the knowledge because we don't always get that coming through a teacher preparation program or some who come with to teaching as their second field um, for their career, we haven't always been able to have the opportunity um, to get that knowledge of to know what to do. And so I would really encourage, you know, to focus the attention there. Um, but speaking back to the specific language about what needs to be included in a screener, um, I have not found currently on the market that there is a screener that screens for each of those key areas. And I'm familiar with the background of where those key areas um, of uh, to be included in a screener came from um, the International Dyslexia Association. Um, but even they will agree that there is not one reading tool or assessment that will assess all of those areas. And so being able to go back um, to, you know, the list that we currently provide to our local education agencies about the reading and literacy assessments that are out there, how do we then give them the information that these key areas that you've outlined, these are the ones that are addressed in these screeners. And how do we educate on what are the characteristics of dyslexia and how do we use the current reading screening and um, that we are using in our school districts to identify those students who may have characteristics of dyslexia 
And then what does that specific intensive intervention look like for those students? So I don't think it's a bad to outline like what's important to consider, but if we write it in in the way that you have to have all of these in your screener, it doesn't exist. Like it's not available. You can't purchase something that assesses all of those areas. And we also have to keep in mind that a screener is meant to be brief. Um, and so if we have to pull from multiple assessments to get at all of those areas, um, not that that's a bad thing, but it's no longer a screener. It's it's mm -hmm. more diagnostic, like you're digging down and doing um, time intensive assessment of students. I just want to go back to uh, Senator Gulick's original question though, and I, I may have missed the answer. Like, I think the question was, in terms of literacy, how would you define maybe your background? Is it science of reading? Is it, you know, I, I think, am I, did I miss the answer there? Full language. Full language. Like, tell us a little bit about that. For sure. So I um, definitely follow the science of reading okay. um, and um, have done a lot of work uh, closely aligned to the International Dyslexia Association. Um, right. A lot with structured literacy, you'll hear that term um, over and over. I know it's been um, pulled out in different testimony that you've heard already around this specific bill. Um, and so I- That's helpful. Does that, yeah, okay. I could go on and on. <laughs> How do you want yeah, me to go? Say is that that's the approach that the agency has taken. I mean, our PD modules are, I mean, we use the neuroscience because really what you're talking about is the underlying neural substance. What are the operational pieces? I so think, we're not talking whole language. We're not talking whole language. Okay, it, that's... But we do know too that science of reading does not equal structured literacy, right? I mean, the science of reading is how is it that we approach developing literacy proficiency in learners, and then you have approaches by which you can do that, right? Center group. Uh, would you be willing to send us or send me um, language that... Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Because I think we want to be really specific. Like, would you just finish that question? Oh, <laughs> 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 the so the language that would fit for yes. is with yeah. the screeners. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If it yeah. isn't quite right, then yeah. what would be as comprehensive as possible? Right that we might see in some yeah. of our screeners, because we want to kind of try to yeah. mimic that, right? Including but, like the four instance language, right? Yeah. Because we, what we want to do is we want to say, don't think that you're just going to check box it the way through, because you might then, that runs the risk of pulling people out of actual instruction. Right. And even the IDA, right, says, you know, you don't want to have assessment that then starts to interfere with teaching and learning, Yeah. right? So that that's our one recommendation. And, and yeah. to, your, to your point then, it, would help uh, if there was a, a screen or an assessment being used that did not match it, so then it could point people to the best practice. That would be so, great. And that's where the single point rubric comes yes. in, that so you can evaluate. Okay. Um, I know we're getting close on time, so. Uh, no, you're, you're good, Ash. Oh, okay. Hey, wait. No, you're not good. I know. <laughs> I, I had that feeling. I had that sense. Um, now that you're not good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, wait, well, you are good. Oh, you're coming at 2.45? Yeah, you're good. Oh, you're good. So okay. this shifted. Sorry. Oh, okay. We do not have a time deficit. Okay. Um, <laughs> or deficit. Okay. Uh, so I think in the next se section, there's going to be sort of similar observations and considerations. And there is a, a, a quote from uh, Oser at the U.S. Department of Education. That's the Office of Special Education Rehabilitation around you know, and this is, Meg, this is your shop, so page seven, really getting into, um, we have been leaning into and really building out guidance around multi-tiered systems of support. We also have uh, guidance on uh, working with students who are then subsequently identified with disabilities. And so we want to make sure that our language is generally in alignment with what we already have in regulation. I don't know if you want to speak to this section on provide reading interventions for students who exhibit substantial deficiencies in reading. Other than readings? No. I mean, page four, line three. Uh, well, we're on page seven. seven. Of what, the bill or of your... Uh, of, uh, of our class. So oh, this would sorry. be uh, right. section you one, D through F. So yeah, in the, generally the concern being that um, as much as possible to have language that aligns with and reflects existing law, rule, and policy, um, no, I, this is page seven up there. Yes, I'm not there. Yeah, and yes. 
That makes Same. sense. When we think more is more, it's yeah. not. Um, but I think from the, that perspective of when, to what degree we might already have some of this guidance through our layered systems of support in place that we could reference so that we don't run the risk of it getting money for people. And, and there are definitely challenges around implementation. And as people think about how students receive additional supports, um, I think particularly, and if I'm remembering correctly, there may be timelines also it, in this section or one of the next, and wanting to make sure that if we're referencing something like an individual reading plan, knowing that already in our education quality standards, there is language around uh, identifying additional supports in students' personalized learning plans. Uh, uh, those things are often reflected in education support team plans, EST plans, in Section 504 plans, in, in uh, IEP or individual education plans. And so what we would want is some guidance about what kind of instruction and support a student should be getting outside of uh, structures that already exist within the school that should, that should be used, if that makes sense. Does make sense. Um, and we can, again, draft some language if that would be helpful so that we're getting at what you want, but using the same language that's in existing. Yeah, so the independent reading plan has been referenced before also, so yeah, have already been alerted to that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So All right. Thank yeah. you for bringing up your trips. Yeah. Um, so I think getting into the school districts and approved independent school to provide families with notification of identified reading deficiencies. Um, and that is where you're uh, making um, some recommendations around uh, parent notification and 100%, you know, we 100% for parent notification and also understand the desire to have that happen as quickly as possible. Uh, and again, we're, we're open. I just know that there could be some conflict with existing federal and state law rule and policy that has very specific guidelines around notification, child find, those types of pieces. And, and looking at that 15-day window, knowing that generally under IDA, there's a 30-day notification period. And again, yes. Heather, please correct me if I'm um, wrong in any of this, uh, but wondering if we might want to align some of those timelines to that so that there's just no, what you would want is someone conflating and then, you know, thinking they have to do 15 days when they have 30 days, right, or vice versa, um, but rather say, okay, particularly if there's the possibility that this is getting to a point where a student maybe is identified as having a disorder or disability and not, you know, a deficit, um, that then moves into the IEP realm, and then you don't want to have something where you've got one law, a state law, conflicting, saying 15 days, federal law, saying 30 days, and then they're fighting, right? Right. Um, and again, we'd be happy to draft language that, and again, if you stick with 15 days, we understand, but I, I, that would be something that could create some confusion. I mean, is there, would it be possible to do 15 days for a non-IEP 504 student or whatever? And it's, has... it's interesting. I, I don't think we, we have anything around educational support teams where we have guidance that, that represents a, a, a timeline other than to say um, families should be part of, the caregivers should be part of the conversation from the beginning as soon as, so um, that is something I'm, I think we'd be happy to, to look into when we go back. I just don't believe that that's in our current mm -hmm. laws or statutes right. right. anyway. And, and even thinking through maybe something like a no later than, yeah, right. Right? right, to inspire earlier, but say there's absolutely a cut point. What's the pushback on that? I mean, I, actually, I, I, I'm just thinking about our, our Vermont MTSS survey has questions in it around when families are notified um, around uh, uh, educational support team. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but what I would be very happy to do is find out wh what's the percentage, because uh, I imagine it's fairly high, but that it would be good to, to look at the numbers. It wouldn't be specific to uh, literacy, of course, but it could be just when an educational support team is convened around a particular kiddo, wh uh, what's, the, what's the timeline or what's the percentage of families that are notified right away? And I think that might give us a, an idea of what we're talking about in terms of 
of need? Is it um, is it a, a small percentage that we're really trying to target, or is it more of a universal across our our schools and districts? So I'd be very happy to dig into that even and report back. But as far as like that question about like what's the right. yeah. I, I, there is. we're not okay. assuming yeah yeah okay. you know I sat on an ESD leadership team we met on a weekly basis we went through every student who was hitting our flags in our early warning system um, and, and looking at them you know when yeah. teachers look in families the mm. beginning you know it's your child is I notice they're struggling what are yeah. you noticing about yeah. so sooner better mm. um. So uh, the next section, and this is section one, G through J, I believe, school districts and approved independent schools to report certain reading performance data to the agency. Again, we're, you know, we're really excited about this and um, have been working towards this, but I, I do think we, we're going to need, um, it's a complex process. We would need some time um, to build this out. We have been uh, continuing our work both with the Region 1 Comprehensive Center, which I think we referenced in our testimony on the 5th, where working with the Vermont Curriculum Leaders Association, we rolled out our literacy learning plan template and our uh, playbook for uh, system leaders for the state literacy plan. And with that, that will be a tool, and many states have these. Um, and in fact, actually, we were just posted on LinkedIn. Um, uh, but from that perspective of looking at building that out, that could mirror some of the data points that you've outlined here that you want to collect, um, building that into a web-based platform so that we can collect that in a way that then can report data. Mm -hmm. There's a data collection component in our advanced management system. That's also where our continuous improvement plan lives. We also have just um, been scoping out a, a plan. It would be a two-year, two or three-year study with the Regional Education Laboratories, NEI, Northeast Islands research team to look across all of the assessments that the agency ingests to help us get a sense of what, what direction can we go in with the goal of possibly being able to pull up some of those local assessment data and, and maybe incorporate into our state accountability plan. Um, but that's, a, that's something that's going to take like a three to five year road to build out that component also because we have to follow federal timelines. Um, but that's something that we're wanting to do. So I think if the goal was to have us have to have a report um, next December, I would want to be frank that I'm I'm not sure it would be a good one. Um, and so I don't know if there's any flexibility there in thinking about getting us to a point where maybe we could come in next year to talk about how we're progressing and building out the collection mechanism. How do you feel about this? I think um, anything's on the table. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. And kind of following up on that, I don't need to answer, but I guess it's more of a question of yeah. having more staff would help mm -hmm. facilitate some of this work. Sure. Uh, sure. You're good at us? Yeah, I'm going to feed it every Thank you. Um, Thank you. You know, and then I think, you know, when we get to just looking on page nine, look at that, we're at the end. Um, skipping over a few things because they're there, and again, we can continue to work through this. Um, there's a few suggested edits that are just sort of tweaks. Um, I think that with the, the I already said this, but with the EPP, the Educator Prep Programs, um, I really want to have folks from the Education Quality Division who oversee the ROPA, um, the results oriented program approval process, here to speak to that. Because I'm not really sure if I understand what is meant by reading instructional program because there's they structure themselves differently. They don't generally have like a program like at schools, you know, you might have a textbook or something like that. Where are you? I'm on the last page, page, last okay. page and the Where? suggested edits. I'm in the okay. last second to last bullet. Okay, that's section yeah. one. Well you're in the bill though. Sorry. This is section it's one J four. We try to put here little here. No, I know. I'm just trying to mark it. Where's G? It's page well, seven. On the bell. Yeah. Page yeah. seven. Yeah. 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 And just not shifting too far away, when is the EPP review back? We had asked, I know, for an assessment of educational programs at 
in our mm-hmm. colleges. Do we know when that's coming back? We published it. You did? Yeah. Okay. And, Thank you. Um, but so we just, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, so made a set, we published it, We and I think we did have a chance to speak with you. There were some recommendations, but we can send you, I actually think the link is in the summary okay. document that we provided you on the 5th when we testified of like the activities that we engaged in. There's a report hyperlink, but I will send it to you. Do you mind just resending it to me? Yeah, and I'm wondering, absolutely. Senator Kulik, is that where your question to, uh, maybe it was, I don't remember what college, but I think you asked the question about whole language. Is that where that came from? Yeah, that's the most. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. And, yes, I'd like to see that again. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, we would just say, I think what we spoke to on the 5th is, um, our next steps, if we are able to go forward, is to, because we really focused on in-service, right? So we, we got that report, we started the work, mm-hmm. and it literally was, what is going to have the greatest impact in the middle of the pandemic when we're thinking about advancing literacy learning and to focus on in-service supports mm-hmm. for teachers? So we sort of stood that down. That's why we focused on the PD modules, the playbook, the data literacy, the assessments. And now what we'd like to do is return to some of those recommendations, which are going to require some partnership with folks that certainly we don't have regulatory authority over, right? So it's going to take some partnership, um, if you will. Okay. Um, and then I think the, the last thing uh, among these generally um, would be in that 16 BSA section 2903 part A is you're proposing to put in um, reading specialist, so uh, which a school reading specialist shall provide, knowing that there are various permutations of terms, titles, et cetera. I think it might be sufficient to say which a school shall provide because some people might call themselves the Wilson reading teacher or the literacy specialist or the, interventionist. or the interventionist or whatever. So I think, you know, you could even say which a school shall provide from a qualified professional, right? Just so that folks don't start running out to rename everybody a reading specialist or. All right, so school shall provide, what was your? Um, difficulty, in, or which a school shall provide by a qualified professional. Boy, qualified though, hmm. I have to think about that one. Qualified yeah. professional, reading professional, qualified. So, and this, and Heather, if, if you've got something, I'm trying to think about this from the perspective of like, what if you had a school psychologist within the district who also had expertise in this area. Their title is school psychologist. They might be someone who could provide services, but they're not a reading professional. They're school psychologists. Okay, so, but who would have oversight over that, I guess is my question. The, is that right? The decision making process of who's qualified? The superintendent, the principal, yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Well, and also our our licensing team and our, our, you know, our standard for those type of things, right? But so, but because I thought I just heard you say like they don't need to be a licensed reading specialist. Oh no! What I was saying is that people have different titles, right? So right. you would have some. They have to be a licensed educator to be, right? Yes. And they have to be endorsed in those particular areas. Yeah. But here's like a correspondent, like with flexible pathways, right? We have people who are dual enrollment coordinators, early college coordinators, flexible pathway coordinators. PLP coordinators, work-based learning coordinators, they all oversee flexible pathways, but they call themselves something different, right? And I think from the perspective of saying, if we can identify from a qualified professional, which means that you are licensed and you are endorsed in the area. So of, I'm a French teacher who also has an Orton Gillingham certification, and I have a French endorsement, a reading specialist endorsement, and I also have a science endorsement. But somewhere in there, there's a reading specialist endorsement, right? A read, I don't know if that's the right term. I'm sorry if I don't know the right terms, but I guess I'm just kind of understand better. But mm-hmm. I help me. Help yeah, me. I'm I'm trying to think this through because it's like you have folks who may have training, but they are hired for a role, right? Okay. Like the literacy interventionist. I 
So they don't, so you're saying they shouldn't have to have a specific endorsement in reading. I'm saying that they could have that endorsement, but they would have a they could have a different title such yeah. as the literacy. Right. Director. So maybe, right. maybe the yeah. goal. So right. I'm trying to add. Yeah. That's what I'm saying because I, I so think take the title away right. and not put the goal that you're looking exactly. For. So I yes. think when you're putting reading specialist in there, it sounds like a title, but what you're talking about is a qualified professional. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The school psychologist who and, also yeah. has this, right? Qualified is the key word. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. And that's yes. why, because what you don't want is someone to either say, well, we don't have a reading specialist. And you're like, but you have a literacy interventionist. And this is what, right. and they're like, oh, but I thought the title is right. So I think it's just by having it be a school shall provide by a qualified professional, gotcha. right? Mm -hmm. Who is guided by all of the rules that govern licensing and endorsements and all of those things. Great. Yeah. All right. I know. It's, I know. I have a really hard final question for you, which is there are a lot of edits and suggestions in here, which I greatly appreciate. Can you sum up briefly what's in the end if we were to take all these suggestions? And we have other ones too that yeah. we need to get. I need to get pulled back out. But what's what's left in this bill? What do we What do we end up with in the end? Yeah. Well. Again, you would cut most of this out because the only sort of suggested edits or proposed language are in like that one section. I think you have a lot here that is, we would probably want to go back and maybe mark this up so it's clear to align to the language because a lot of those recommendations are like, well, let's just align to this. So we would be adding stuff in, but you've got a lot here where it's a focus on um, and strengthening that critical to improving literacy outcomes is that you have to be engaging in that universal screening. You have to be leveraging your multi-tiered system of support. You have to be responding quickly, right? And you have to be intervening in a way that is meaningful, right, and guided by data. And that is that is strengthening that in this, in the statute, and that hasn't been there, right? We just want to make sure that we don't spend all of our time trying to translate for folks, right, or like avoid those conflicts. And that's that's what's really exciting about this. Awesome. I was hoping you would say that. But yeah. I just wanted to make yeah. sure that yeah. we're on the same page. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Wow. And put us in there. Yes. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, super. Any other comments from Ms. Lesh? Did you want to? No? I don't have anything further okay. right now. Yeah. No, I think they've okay. Okay. everyone. Again. Oh, great job. Um, Emily. 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 It's really easy. Emily. Just say Emily. <laughs> Emily. <laughs> Emily. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Doxy. Willis Doxy. Willis Doxy. Thank you. That's okay. I'll answer to either Dr. Heather, Dr. Willis Doxy. Um, no, I'm excited to see, you know, in, in a legislative approach to in the things that we've already put in place in school districts that are best practice, you know, this just kind of has a formal placeholder for it. And I appreciate the um, collaborative spirit to ensure that we're able to clear up any language that may be, um, may cause some confusion out in the school district. So I just appreciate the time yeah. to be able to collaborate um, with you guys to make sure that we're all sharing our perspectives and getting it right. I appreciate the enthusiasm and you know, the collaboration as well. So we're yeah. we're all yeah, thank you excited. So much. That's right. We're <laughs> still to do, but we're gonna start to mark yeah. it up next week. And, awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And we appreciate that walking through a, a forty complicated topic on a Friday <laughs> afternoon after a very robust week. That's a nice word. We'll I like it. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Good to see all of you. Thank you. Great to meet you. Congratulations, Heather. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Great seeing all of you. We we do uh we we have not received, not that you had homework, um, that spreadsheet you said you had some schools, but we have put together and trying to put together. So it's still on offer. Very interesting. You want to offer. Um, and then we also had a fantastic conversation with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum this week and are meeting with them next week. They're going to be helping us with our sequence um, and have offered to come up and provide professional learning 
So just wanted to share. That's that wonderful. John. That's Thank great, you. Jess. And yeah. the other thing we learned yesterday is, um, and I believe it might be in our folders, today, you know, Holocaust education. And here's the other thing. I'm sure this has been told to me a million times, but it's in the standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it sent her, uh, yeah. Mr. Bannon sent us the link, and it's yeah. so I, I think that goes through. So that maybe needs to. Marinate on it over the weekend, yeah. and we'll have a conversation next week. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. 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 Our last bit of business today is an interesting one, higher education incentivization uh, in Vermont. We have Jay Jacobs correct. and Katie Mobley, correct. welcome, and Mar uh, Maurice Wiemat. Correct. We met. You got us. Nice say bye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very excited to have all of you here. And we'll just go around the table so you all know uh, where you're talking to. We'll start with the Vice Chair. Hi, Senator Mark P. Monroe Fulick. I live in Burlington and represent Chittenden Central. But the Clerk? Terry Williams, the uh, from uh, Rump County of Rump Ranking member? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I'll promote you. <laughs> no. uh, Dave Weeks, uh, Rump County. And Brian Campion, uh, Bank County. So the floor is yours, and we we'll look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, uh, as you said, my name is Jay Jacobs. I use he pronouns, Vice Provost for Enrollment Management at the University of Vermont. And I'm Katie Mobley. I'm the Dean of Enrollment at the Community College of Vermont. And Maurice Lamette, uh, Vice President for Admissions and Enrollment Services for Vermont State University. Uh, Katie, Maurice, and I wanted to come and talk to, talk to you all about um, our collaboration as the three public institutions of higher education in the state. Um, in uh, well, in tackling what we perceive to be one of the largest problems we're seeing in the state, which is the college going rate amongst our, our high school graduates. Um, I, we sent along a, a PowerPoint. I'm not sure if you uh, were able to see it or have it in front of you. We have it right here in our folders, uh, in the folder. And if you don't mind, we'll also bring it up on the screen. I don't mind. Oh. And uh, Martinez is the one that has the Okay. <laughs> I like to rifle through his pocket filter. That's it. I can also pull it up on my screen, but are we going to pull it up on the big screen? We're going to pull it up to the big screen so uh, that you can have a look. I love this uh, color palette. On a Friday, you need the bright it's colors. Nice bright. Not for that. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Maurice, Maurice asked me to t tone down the UVM branding, but I didn't <laughs> tone down the UVM colors. <laughs> 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 to, to be fully transparent. We're all fully transparent. <laughs> <laughs> <We're all laughs> <totally great. laughs> um, all right. So if you want to scroll to the, the next slide, thanks. So we wanted to first just. Uh, level set everybody on the challenges that we are facing as higher as high, the higher education industry in the state. Um, you've likely heard about the quote unquote demographic cliff um, and the declining numbers of college eligible students. So uh, the graphic on the top was uh, uh, both graphics actually uh, were taken uh, from the New England uh, Secondary School Consortium's <laughs> recent report uh, that talked about the total number of high school graduates has been declining uh, over the past four years by 2%. In 2021, the state of Vermont had just over 5,700 total high school graduates. Um, and the high school graduation rate has also declined by 2% in the, over the last period. In fact, on the bottom graphic in the bottom right corner, you can see that Vermont actually has the lowest high school graduation rate in New England, uh, just over 83%. Um, if you move to the next slide, um, this is simply showing that the end is not in sight in the with the demographic cliff. Wichy, the uh, Western Institutions of uh, Commission for Higher Education, um, projects that the number of high school graduates within the state of Vermont will actually continue to drop by 17% between now and the academic year of 2036-37. 20, 
most of these, most of this drop comes from our public school graduates uh, with over a thousand of those students um, uh, dropping off the cliff. And what this, the, these data don't show is a potential second cliff due to the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, 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 lessening birth rates to have that make. The demographic cliffs are scary, but moving to the next slide, I think this is what uh, Maurice, Katie, and I believe is actually the most pressing problem that we see in the state, which is our college, our college going rates of those college eligible uh, high school graduates. Um, in fact, um, we have the lowest college going rate in all of New England and among the bottom eight uh, college going rates throughout the country. In 2021, uh, 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 again, according to the uh, New England Secondary School Consortium, um, uh, just under half of our students who graduated from high school decided to enroll in college in 2021. And on the right is data from IPEDS, um, uh, the National um, Education um, uh, Clearinghouse, uh, shows about 55% of the class of 2020 enrolled in college. Moving to the next slide, uh, just to um, uh, kind of uh, segment the, these changes out a little bit. You can see between 2019 and 2021, four-year public institution, four-year public institutions in the state uh, dropped enrollment by uh, just over four percent between those two years. Um, the national average was three percent. Uh, you all know very well um, what Maurice and Vermont State has been going through. Uh, I'm sure you've read what the University of Vermont has been going through over the past few years. And moving to slide six, um, it's the same data from 2019 to 2021, <laughs> two-year public institutions in the state uh, actually is a different story. We've seen an increase of somewhere between three and 4% in, in, in two-year college enrollment in the state, one of only five states in the union to see a positive growth in two year. And uh, from what Katie tells me, 2022 and 2023 were actually better than this 4%. Good news. Um, unfortunately, however, it doesn't seem like the college going rate decline is um, uh, has an end in sight either. Moving to the next slide, this these are data that just came from a most recent VSAC report that's showing the college aspiration of Vermont's Vermonters are continuing to drop. The aspiration gap is actually led by male identifying students and students who are first in their family to attend college or first generation students. Uh, you can see those figures at the top right segmented out by gender and parents' educational attainment. Um, and um, you know, we we all read often, three of us read often, the percent the the value, the perceived value of higher education on the on the decline. And you can see that parents are emphasizing college less um, uh, in the bottom right graphic there. And trending long term, moving to slide eight, um, uh, this is really bad news for the state economy, right? Uh, the the uh, Georgetown's um, Center for Education and Workforce um, is projecting that by 2031, over half, 51% of the jobs forecasted to be in Vermont at that time will require at least a degree, and an additional 17% will, will require at least some college, bringing the total number of jobs in the state in 2031 uh, requiring at least some college to over 68%. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, we wanted to dig in to understand actually where are Vermonters going to college. Uh, we decided to use uh, 2020 data. This is the most complete, the most recent data set that we have available to us using um, the national database iPads. Um, in 2020, there were 57, 70 students enrolled in high school in Vermont. 83% of them graduated from high school. That brings us to just under 4,800 and just under half of them enrolled in college, bringing us to uh, just under 2,350 students enrolling in college, and about just under 70% of them went to college in state. You can see on the right graphic where those students went uh, that year. That means 730 student, 38 students attended college outside of Vermont, and if you dig into the data even deeper, you can find that those students are enrolling in private institutions, uh, mostly throughout New England and New York State. 
So moving to slide 10, um, this is the reason we're here. Um, we wanted to show you all um, how we are starting to collaborate in an early way to tackle the college going rate. Over the past few months, we have had the opportunity to talk to many uh, of our colleagues on the K-12 side and school counselors. Uh, we were uh, 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 accepted to have a panel session at the Vermont School Counselor Association Conference uh, that included the three of us and a, and a colleague from VSAC um, down in Killington in November. And we had a great conversation with probably 30 to 40 counselors there um, discussing where students are going, why students are going to college, and most importantly, why students are not going to college, which we'll dive into here uh, on the next slide. We had a similar conversation at the University of Vermont's campus with um, my admissions team's Vermont School Counselor Advisory Board. We are and have been, uh, but continue to be working on pathway and articulation agreements between the institutions. So UVM and CCV have over 30 two plus two pathways where students can get their associate's degree at CCV, seamlessly transfer to obtain their bachelor's degree at the University of Vermont and graduate in four years. Uh, we have similar pathway agreements with BTC, sorry, Vermont State, sorry, or <laughs> Vermont State. Uh, they were with BTC, and we're grateful for Maurice and his leadership in making sure that those articulation pathways agreements uh, uh, stood in the status quo with the, with the merger with the state colleges, the four-year state colleges, um, and of course, CCV and Vermont State have those pathway agreements. Um, and we want to continue to look at what agreements might look like from the four-year programs at Vermont State in the graduate programs at the University of um, and then finally, and, and lastly, um, Katie's team of, of advisors at CCV meet regularly with um, the admissions teams and the registrar teams at Vermont State and the University of Vermont in order so that they, the advisors, have the knowledge that they need to help pass down to students for student-centered pathway transfer uh, uh, pathways, not necessarily just the articulation agreements, but the more traditional transfer pathways. Uh, between the institutions as well. And then finally and lastly, you know, we wanted to showcase what we have heard uh, from, from the past few months of collaborating together on why Vermonters are going and or not going to college. Um, and we found that, the, that there were really two main reasons that bubbled up to the top for both. Um, oh, sorry. And um, uh, they're, actually very, they're actually very similar. The reasons that students go, the reasons that students go to college um, are because they have that expectation from their parents or their caregivers, and they know that going to college will provide a sound financial future for them and their families. On the flip side, students are not going to college for similar reasons, but opposite side of the coin, right? Um, they don't believe in their ability to do college level work, or they don't believe that college is um, so this is the question that we've been asking ourselves. How can we, the royal we, collectively between the institutions of public higher education in the state, VSAC, you all of the state government, the secondary education counselors and the teachers, fix this college going rate problem? So we wanted to think about things to address confidence levels and the ability for students to see themselves on their campus, be that through um, direct admissions programs, for example. We just saw New York State announce theirs um, just last week. The state of Texas has done this for years and years and years, where the top 10% of can, can you explain direct? Yes. Yeah, where the top 10% of, in, in the state of Texas and the state of te New York, yeah. the top 10% of high school graduates are automatically admitted to their state's flagship. Financial uh, issues, irregardless. Uh, I believe so, yes. If family can pay, they're still, the state's still paying. Uh, no, no, no. This is just this is just the admission, an admission offer. I think the financial aid is is a separate process. Um, but we know in New York, for example, they can go. Students can go to uh, community colleges for free, or Maine they can go to community colleges for free, things like that. Um, do we require high school students in order to graduate from high school to fill out the FAFSA, the free application for federal students? We've seen other states do this. We've seen their FAFSA submissions go um, um, up dramatically. And Sorry, is this a recommendation? 
it's not necessarily a recommendation. It's a it's something that we have been collectively thinking about okay. potentially recommending mm -hmm. to the state of the future. Mm -hmm. Um, um, or other programs that instill confidence, right? How can we make sure that students are on our campuses, engaging with our faculty, with our students, and feeling and seeing themselves um, being successful on our campuses before they even enroll? So you said that New York did this? Yes. And how long ago did they do this? A week, two weeks oh, ago. Okay. All right. So the uh, next question was, did they see a bomb? In, in Texas has done it uh, since the 70s. Yeah. Okay. Do they have a history of a bump? You know, they showed kind of before, then offering these, uh, you know, 10%. They, uh, I think Texas's uh, issues were a little bit different than ours in Vermont. They saw a bump in um, uh, BIPOC students, a technologist. There's a lot of data out there to support that. Just removing enrollment barriers certainly increase yeah. the one for eight. Yeah. You're accepted. There you go. The anxiety around the process, right? At least. So there's no application. You graduate within the top 10%, and yeah, you can yeah. give a letter or whatever. Like right. There's no year. gathering letters of recognition, <clears throat> taking tests, you know, making sure your high school trains are presented. So this isn't something you need legislation to do, right? This is just something you could do. No, because we would need coordination. Well, I don't want to say three events. From the agency event. So think about like the data sharing that happens in Vermont. K-12 data is held very separate from higher ed. Okay. So we don't have the ability to say to you of the 5,700 students that we know who they are or could reach out to them. So there'd have to be, it would need to be from legislation, I believe. I don't know if you think differently. No, I agree with you. Is it yeah. just gonna, it's a really good community feel like that. Just yeah. I mean, really, again, it's because the agency of education, those grades are very private. Mm -hmm. They're <clears throat> yeah. once, the agency identifies the top 10% of each school or has them report it, those students would get a letter. And we could even potentially expand that, right? That's coming yeah. from right. you know, UVM's perspective. Right. Yeah. I want the rest yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Even, <laughs> uh, yeah. Even UVM, you know, you know, the top 10% is probably too too small of a of a yeah. cut. I don't know what the right cut would be. Top yeah. 30%, 50%. I mean, we admit Vermonters at a 70% rate and right at, at the University of Vermont. Well, yeah. So what does that mean? Sorry, Senator. No, you go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, so how does that change in terms of out of state with regard to standards? It, are you saying, for example, a B minus kid might get into the University of Vermont from Vermont, but a B minus kid of, you know, from California might not. Is that, or you just have an I, you're a little more generous, a little more liberal, a little more understanding if, yeah. in, the, in the interest of serving Vermont. Yeah, in, in our holistic admissions process, we um, uh, want to make sure that we're serving our land grant mission by right. ensuring a, uh, 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 a, a critical mass of Vermonters in each class. Great, Senator Buick. Yes, I just wanted to ask about the, the demographic clip, which I believe is not unique to Vermont. I believe this right. is like uh, the countrywide, maybe even worldwide, and minus a robust immigration system, I don't see it going away. Um, is there talk at federal level to, to like what the future is going to look like? Um, I, I wish there were like a plan mm -hmm. um, because it seems as though we're not going to be able to fill all of our schools as time continues on. Again, minus a robust immigration plan, that which we don't seem to have either. Um, so there's no plan. Okay. No, short of, I mean, I mean, this is a small step, but going back towards those enrollment barriers, the changes that have been recently made to the FAFSA, right? That's yeah. what called the FAFSA simplification process. So yeah. that was something that some families would just hear and they couldn't even deal with it. I mean, thank goodness we have VSAC in our state and, and yeah. they, they provide the services that they do, but. Um, that, that this is a step from the feds at least and trying to make the process a little simpler. Yeah, so, and sure. um, I really appreciate the what you're doing. I was a first generation college student and it was, you know, the whole thing was so shrouded in mystery mm -hmm. that it was very scary. Mm -hmm. And I see it in where I live with, um, you know, first gen and also new Americans. I mean, it, it is just terrifying. And even once they get there, um, you know, I think, I wasn't very supported. I mean, back to the old days anyway. Um, and I think to, you know, to this day, um, it's really difficult for students. So I appreciate any like demystifying you can do and 
like you say, you know, just improving confidence. Because yeah. So many kids have the potential. Yeah. Yeah. I think Sometimes that's it's why. just getting kids on your campus. So, I, yeah. work, I've been at Bangor yeah. College forever, yeah. and it's always surprising to me the number yeah. of local kids that haven't been on the sure, college campus. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say Martin, too, dual enrollment is a huge part of this. So getting yeah. students to have an early experience where they have that confidence. Um, and then I jokingly said this in house, but I'll say it again. And then the open end of the funnel is CCB. So having students start in a more expensive, excuse me, less expensive, more flexible environment where then there's collaboration for someone to go on. So the risk isn't as, right. as big, but we do a lot. I think too, the, yeah, you know, we talked about this in house too, but uh, <laughs> the idea of students entering the workforce shouldn't be discouraged necessarily either because there's the pairing of they can continue with higher education while they're working with their employer. Oftentimes, they're getting assistance from their employer. It makes it a lot more affordable. They're not biting it all off in, in, uh, in, at one time, and they're kind of wading into the water. So, you know, there's this stigma that's out there about, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to go to college because my parents, you know, they'll support me or no one in my town goes to college. I'm just going to stay here and I'm going to go to work. Well, you can do both, you know, and, and trying to change the narrative around that. And I think yeah, as a as a system, we're doing that um, very well with the focus on workforce development. But that seems to be targeted more at, you know, 30-somethings and maybe 40-somethings. And, and how do we get those students that are coming out of our high schools that are just doing nothing right now? Right. How do we engage with them to show them focus opportunities? Making it the easy choice, right? right? Like, I think right. that's sort of the theme. Right. Yes. And I would just also say, um, just trying to eliminate, and eliminate the barriers, yes. I think. We don't have enough guidance counselors to help every sure. kid, and a lot of kids need help, whether it's, you know, filling out the application, filling out the FAFSA, um, just the whole, you know, my, I mean, the money is scary, too. So yeah. Sorry, yeah. like, bringing up all this scary stuff, but... but we've um, thought yeah. about collaborating yeah. in the in the fall on, you know, application days, where our admissions teams can bleed out into the high schools to help students apply to college. Yeah. Not the University of Vermont, not right. Vermont, just apply to college. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, Katie brought up in the house, you know, what I love the term they yeah. use, predictive affordability, right? Yes. So the 802 opportunity grants is a great example of that yeah. was students uh, and families making $75,000 or less being able to uh, attend CCB without tuition. Yeah. Uh, we replicated that at the University of Vermont with our institutional funds in the UVM Promise. Maurice has done a similar one mm -hmm. uh, at, at Vermont State. How can, how can the 802 Opportunity Grant be scaled up to include four-year institutions. Yeah, that's something to kind of, that we didn't really dig into too much the last session, but I think that's a challenge. As a legislature, it's a challenge, right? Because you're working one year at a time and right. funds are available one year at a time. But, you know, the critical occupation scholarship program, yeah. we were incredibly mm -hmm. grateful for that money. It helps so many students. But yeah. to, to, you know, Katie's point, it's hard to predict that, right? So right. the legislative process, the, 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 the bill is approved late in the, in the session. Yeah. A lot of students are already made the decisions by that. Right. Right? But it's hard. I don't get multi year planning out there yeah. um, to do this as a challenge, right? So, yeah. yeah. so, about incorporating some technical, uh, like a technical college. I know, you know I couldn't get into Castleton or UVM when I, went, when I got out of high school. So, I went to New Hampshire to one of the boat techs up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, got a skill. Yeah. And I, when I got out, I got drafted. But, you know, I mean, and I, I actually got my bachelor's degree while I was in the Army. Yeah, so there's awesome. no, there's no, uh, there's no carrot and a, and a stick either, because right. you know, if, if they can go out into the workforce, I mean, you know, McDonald's is paying eighteen bucks an right. hour. Right. Sure. So, yeah. and they're saying, hey, I can go make this much money, and I don't have to go to college. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we talk a lot about you know, our and this year after the age is 27. So often we see students after they've worked at McDonald's for yeah. five years and they're like, okay, this is yeah. not where I want to be, yeah. right? So I think yeah. that open end of the funnel being available for students, but we did talk a lot about the role of, um, I don't I don't think, well, I'll speak for myself. I, I don't think CCB feels like college has to be for everyone, but we want it to be available for everyone. Like you don't have to make that choice, but right now in Vermont, too many students are not even considering that choice, right? So we've got to flip the narrative, I think in that way, and then work with students and adults sort of throughout that progression. Yeah, how about the Randolph? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, I was just going to say, there's a post-secondary opportunity for every Vermonter right here, Yeah. right? Whether exactly. it's a, a yeah. certificate program or an apprenticeship program like you're describing like, that we're offered through the legacy VTC programs, yeah. you know, to a certificate program, to, you know, right. a, a pathway to a nursing degree through right. CCB, to all the way to a, a, a doctoral degree at UVM, right? There, there's there's yeah. something for every Vermonter here. And that's why I think it's, you know, the fact that that we can present as the public face of higher education in Vermont is really going to help people see that you know anybody can come, right? Everybody should be able to come. Same regards. Yeah, I've got uh, one observation, and two questions. First observation is the slide that's I think it's Figure Six. What students report their parents feel would also be interesting to figure to find out what parents feel about what their students, their uh, children, should be. Doing. Is, you know, the, the first comment, the, the whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a student response. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I'm not quite sure that's, you know, parent, parents are a little laissez faire these days, but uh, what they really feel is their children should be doing, I think, would be more, yeah. more interesting than what the kids. Uh, the first question is um, so on the slide about the bad news for the Vermont economy. Um, so 68% of all forecasted jobs require, okay, I, I see that as also a positive. So that means that there's 32% who could be heading towards CTE. And we're all, in this committee, I think we're all very strong CTE sure. supporters. Yeah. I see that as an opportunity, not as a, not as a detractor. It all depends on the spend. So to your point about, you know, what Randolph's doing, what Randolph offers or what, you know, mm -hmm. More technically oriented, you know, I'm not talking about engineering, I'm talking about, you know, the trades. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an opportunity there. And we I don't need to do a better job with that. We, yeah, we I, need to do a better well, job. Well, that leads me to the, the second question. That's, you know, where Vermonter is going. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I see the data, but I'm not sure if you've done the analysis of why. Do you know, what's causing the Vermonters not to, you know, to maybe look at universities outside Vermont or and obviously, they're not looking at the private universities inside Vermont, which we identify here. Uh, so, you know, what's the limitation? Is it you know, the marketing budget? They have, they're getting better deals outside of the state. Okay. Right. Okay. That's, that's the takeaway that's really important here. Yes. Yeah. Is why they're not. It's more affordable for many students to go to college outside of Vermont okay. than it is. Right. We, we have, we won't use names, so we even know folks that wanted to go to UVM, but. It was just they got the bigger box at other institutions. Yeah. 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 Uh, tell us a little something about what kinds of jobs you're referring to when you have 51% of the jobs forecast to be. What, what do those jobs look like in 2031? Do you guys have any sense? I don't know. Okay. This is the Georgetown info. Yeah. This yeah. is the data I just pulled. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tech and medical. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like your I like your point about the guidance uh, system in the high schools. Um, you know, because I my personal experience at 16 decided I didn't want to go to college. I wanted, mm -hmm. I wanted to learn trade. I wanted to go to a, a Stafford, a, you know, Stafford Tech and they right. said, no, you're in a college track, you're not gonna so maybe a little flexibility in yeah. the in the guidance. You know, to, to actually not tell them what they're going to do, but ask them what they want. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think you're addressing that with the funding model, right? With career and tech ed. I mean, that's part of the challenge, right. I think. Yeah. yeah. The efforts that are being made with BSAC and all of us to get into those too, because so many students yeah. in high school yeah. don't even know what some of these programs are. They yeah. don't know the career pathways, right. right? So they're being asked to select something on a form, and they don't even know what they're selecting. I'll select business because that's what right. I should do, or I'll select law, pre-law. You know, I mean, they they don't know what a mechanical engineering technology degree is. Yeah. So it sounds like you'll be doing a lot more like pushing in rather than waiting for them to come to you. Wonderful. Super. That's, yeah. that's a way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Center weeks. Well, I don't know, kind of in summary, uh, what are your asks? Yeah, what do you, I, 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 was this like purely uh, informational or did you have like a yeah. short list of 
no no asks no recommendations yet um you know we wanted to uh come to you all today to talk through to make sure that you understood the challenges that we're facing make sure you understood that we are collaborating and coming up with these ideas yeah. um, for potential recommendations. So the University of Vermont State College and CCB have no request to the legislature this year whatsoever. Not me. You do that for drinking. Right, you don't have to watch it. Right, that's right. That's right. Right, that's right. If we didn't have asked, I would have a This is very interesting, and I think uh guessing committee would be very interested if you all would support it to sort of dig into some of the things that New York and Texas. Yeah. Yes, it's not an ask, but I do think yeah. that collaboration data sharing with our K-12 and higher ed is something, CCB has been participating in a Gates funded initiative this year called Accelerate Ed. It's been amazing, connected to the free degree promise from the McCore Foundation. And over and over again, the theme that comes up is states that have a cohesive model have data sharing across the model. The gap is after year 12. And I totally understand what you were saying before about privacy and there are lawyers who are better tasked sure, to think sure. about that. But it it is, I think it's a real challenge in Vermont. And I think for us to dip in, in the way that you said, Martine, it, it would be helpful to have some more of a bridge um, there. And so that's a little vague, but I think there's yeah, policy. In the old days, when SATs were taken, yeah. You would start to get notes and letters, and I don't know if that's still happening. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Buy less than yeah. 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 Got one more dimension to it too. And I heard from uh, from the National Guard the eight caucus. The Adjutant General said so we can't we can't get into the high schools to try and enlist people enlist uh, soldiers. And you know, if we could keep them, if we can get them, if they want to go in the military, get them in the guard and want them come back to the state and then go to college. Right? Yeah. Because the guard has some great inspiration. We run classes at the guard. I, I mean, they're great. They do yeah. a great job and, with that. And they, you know, yeah. they learn a skill. I don't yeah. care, you know, what you think about the military, but we got to figure some way to keep our people here. Are you saying they can't be school? They only, they're only allowed into that school by, by law, one day a year. Okay. And they're competing with the active component recruiters. Is that a federal policy? Uh, I guess our well, it's I think what I experienced because I was involved in uh, recruiting for the National Guard while yeah. I was in. Uh, they counselors, guidance counselors didn't want you talking to their kids. Because they had them, they already had a career track in mind. So I'm just curious here, who initiated? The three of you coming together was it an illustrious chairman? Or was it you three guys? <laughs> and he took the credit in the house. Okay. I did. Someone said, Well, how are you start working together? He said, I take credit. You guys have a key PowerPoint. I'm going to bring words together. No, encouraged. That's yeah, very encouraging. Yeah. 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 We're all in this together. Yeah, I think we want all of you to, like, we are working closely together and we want Vermonters to know there are options for that. And, yeah. and we need your help it's with changing options. the narrative yeah. in Vermont around higher ed. It's yeah. it's problematic. We, I think we historically have sort of said, oh, well, at least, again, I'll speak for CCD. We want students to make whatever choice they want and know they have options. Students are not <laughs> choosing to pursue the, op they don't know they have the option. Right. And, I, and yeah. I think broadly, higher ed is under a lot of scrutiny and attack. So it's very, we've, we've got sort of a, a tricky environment to be working within. And I think we want all Vermonters to know there is a place for them to go to higher ed. Yeah. Um, and we're going to keep working on it, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so. I know we're running out of time, but what? Um, just to clarify what you would like from us, it sounds like there would be an ask of the AOE to share data with our institutions of higher ed, is that correct? I look to you 
Oh, and you might not be there yet. You might want to think about I, this. And yeah, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't think we're. I don't think we're, we're ready for a, a specific ask or recommendation. Yeah, you can see we're so used but to yeah, having people it. ask us yeah. questions on Friday. Yeah. That's like, no, I no, 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 actually, no, I didn't say that. We we come we come before lunch with our asks. Lunch. From it. From work lunch. Second post. I just want to add that one thing that was mentioned in the last committee is that. You know, this is not something that we're asking for at the moment, but expanding 802 opportunity to four year public institutions would be a real help with this. And so that's something that we may come back in the future after more research is done to recommend. This is a tough year for money. We, we, we know that. <laughs> yes. So, but that's, it's planting the seed of thinking about that in the future. And like Senator Weeks said, I think we all be man, we all feel the same way. We really appreciate the initiative, you know, coming yeah. together on your own, thinking about this, yeah. the best interest of Vermonters. Closing comments. You good. Are you guys gonna uh, race back to Rutland County? You're gonna buy <laughs> <laughs> need to be safe. He's gonna, he's gonna get out of the gate first, but I heard the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Well. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, committee. Um, thanks for a great week. Really super week. Um, we've got a uh, busy week next week. Morgan's finishing the agenda. It's probably already up or looking soon. It will be very quick throughout the evening to see what we're up to. Um, you pick the one with the biggest paper. Um, from this particular? Yeah, no, from, from the, the week. Oh, yeah. That's two or four. Yeah, good work on yeah. this. Two or four. Numbers. That's, That's your literacy bill. Yeah. yeah. Am I still on? You're yeah. still on. But I think, yeah, I think we're done more. Yeah. yeah. Are we feeling yeah, good? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, feeling good? Please. Uh, thanks again.